Amen. How many of you believe in the God of impossibilities? Well, you know, the Bible says that He is in Luke chapter 1, that there's nothing impossible for God. But I'll be honest, in my Christian life, there's been many times I doubted that. Many times I wasn't sure that God, you know, was capable of overcoming something or doing something, especially if it in any way had to do with my life and circumstances that I was going through. You just kind of take a step back and think, man, if God can do this and He doesn't, does that mean He doesn't love me? If God can do this and He doesn't, you know, what's that say about His mercy and His grace? And so rather than going through all of that, it was easier just to be convinced that maybe God just couldn't do something like this. And then I would blame maybe other people. He couldn't do it because these people wouldn't respond and He's not going to make them. But you know, something happened this week that just solidified again once in my heart that God really is the God of impossibilities. When the United States Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. Fifty years we've been waiting. Fifty years people have been praying. And in an instant, God can take something that seems so impossible and make it possible. Isn't that amazing to know that, that we live in a, a, a time when God is, is so willing to reveal himself, to show himself, to convince us that he is still on his throne, and in spite of what others may think, he's still in control. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you so much for just your amazing display of power. God, you work through the affairs of men all the time, and you're doing things that that may seem impossible to us. Your, your waiting and your timing is so perfect, God, that you can, in the, the midst of maybe some of the darkest times of our history as a nation, just flip the switch. And instantly the light comes on and we can see that, that we have a great, merciful, holy God. And Lord, I pray that in our lives as we work through today's message and you know the next several weeks as we look at, at the Beatitudes, that we would be reminded that we have a God that is always at work. You're always doing the impossible in our lives, even when we don't see it, even when we don't expect it. And God, today, I, I pray as we work through something so difficult for all of us, a, a subject that we don't even like talking about, and yet you can bring peace and joy. You can bring happiness in the midst of this. And so today we give you this time, and we ask that you bless your children in Jesus' name. Amen. As you go throughout this week, especially after all that we've experienced in the light of what we have seen God do, and you're trying to decide what the most important thing you need to do to stay in a right relationship with God, I want to encourage you just to remember to keep the main thing the main thing. I mean, those moments when you're giving up hope, when you're, you're you know, maybe coming to the end of something where you're just going to resign to the fact this is the way life's going to be, it's never going to be any, any different, it's never going to be any better, and you're kind of giving up on the idea that God is a God of impossibilities, if you'll just remember to keep the main thing the main thing, and Jesus said in Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37, that that is to love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, you may very well find yourself face to face with a God of impossibilities, a God who can overcome circumstances in the blink of an eye. As we continue our series, Eight Ways to Be Happy, and we look at the eight Beatitudes of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, so far we've talked about the happiness, believe it or not, that is found in our dependency on God. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Oh, how happy are those who depend on God. Now, last week we began to look at the second beatitude from Matthew 5, 4, where Jesus says, blessed, or oh, how happy, are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And although it's a little difficult to kind of get your mind wrapped around the idea that the way to be blessed is to mourn, or the way to be happy is to be sad, we did learn that it's true in spite of what we may have experienced. God blesses those who mourn. Listen, He blesses those who mourn 
especially if we are able to invite God into our pain and into our grief. Sometimes we're so angry, sometimes we're so frustrated with God that he even allowed these circumstances in our life that we kind of turn our back on him. We're not only not inviting him into that pain or into that grief, many times we're actually blaming him for it. God, you could have, uh, you could have uh, you know, helped us avoid this. You could have prevented this from happening in the first place. And so you kind of have to take some responsibility for this, right, God? And so we don't invite God into our pain. We don't invite him into our grief. And so therefore, we have to just kind of wallow in it. And that's exactly what we do. But God says, I will bless those who mourn. I'll bless those who grieve. I'll make them happy. But the only way that God can make you happy is if you invite him into that pain, if you invite him into that grief. When you do, he promises, I'll comfort you. God blesses a broken heart. He makes us happy. And the Bible says that God does that by drawing us close to himself. We talked about that you know, last week. It's like a father you know, drawing his child close to himself when he was hurt, when he was suffering. He comforts us and gives us hope, and then he grieves with us. In other words, he's not unsympathetic to our pain or our problems, and he gives us a church family for support. Those were the first three of the six ways that I believe God blesses and comforts a broken heart. Next is number four. God uses, think about this, he uses grief to help us grow. Now, most of you, whether you understand it or not, you actually believe this because you've experienced it. He does it in three ways, and I want to share three verses with you to kind of illustrate the three different ways, because I think it's important that you take God's Word and build a foundation, you know, for you to kind of have a, a deep understanding of what God wants to do, because once that foundation is established, you always get to go back to it. First, you know, God uses pain to get our attention. You realize that, right? C.S. Lewis wrote this, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. In other words, many times the pain in our life becomes God's megaphone to us. He's saying, hey, do you hear me now? We rarely, rarely will we ever change in good times, in pleasant circumstances. Rarely will we ever change in the light. But you know what? Almost always we find change when we feel the darkness surrounding us, when we feel as though there is no escape. The Bible says this in Proverbs 20, verse 30. This might be, be one of those verses you want to write down or highlight in your bulletin. It says this, Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. Now, anybody agree with that verse? Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. Trust me, pain, disappointment, and grief, those things has changed a lot of things in my life. Fact is, God uses grief to help us grow. He uses grief to help us grow by getting our attention, our attention that otherwise he would have never had. The second way he brings good out of bad is found in Romans chapter 8, 28, where Paul says that we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. We read that verse many times, but I want you to understand these two words. He says we know. Not we guess, not we hope. He says we know. We know that in all things, not just a few things, not in, you know, just the things that, that, that we can see clearly, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. That means that every time you go through any kind of pain, it is an opportunity to grow in your character. You can't control the pain you go through. You may have chronic pain the rest of your life, and that pain may be you know, with you for, forever. You can't always control that, but you can decide whether you're going to, to, to allow it to make you bitter or better, whether you're going to allow it to be a stepping stone or a stumbling block. 
God is going to bring good out of bad. And so imagine whatever's going on in your life right now. Maybe some of you walked in here and your stomach's been churning maybe for weeks. And you know either something's coming or something is going on right now. And it overwhelms you. If you can just take the Word of God and begin to build on that as a foundation of your faith, go back to what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And tell yourself that over and over if you have to. I know that in all things, not just a few things, but even in in what I'm feeling and experiencing right now, I know that in all things, God's going to work this out. Somehow he's going to make something good come out of this. I don't know how. In, In my wildest dreams, I can't imagine ever saying, praise God for this. But someday you may. Man, I look back on a lot of the things that happened in my life, and I can, I can tell you with all integrity before God that I can look at those things and say, praise God. Because had that not happened, there are just a few little things that I could have gone in any direction in my life. And if something hadn't happened, I would have, and I wouldn't be standing on this platform today. In other words, if I'd have just made one decision to go left instead of right... I wouldn't be here. And so when I look back and I realize in these circumstances, maybe as painful as they were, God used that in such a great and glorious way. So whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're feeling right now, use the word of God as a foundation to build your faith on. Say, I don't understand it. I don't like it. It's the worst thing I've ever felt in my life. But according to God's word, I can trust that he's going to use this somehow to make something good come out of this. Third thing he does is he prepares us for eternity. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, the Bible tells us that our light and momentary troubles. Now, nobody likes those two words together, light and momentary. It's like it might be light for you, it might be momentary for you, but this is like, you know, over the top for me. This is like, you know, all I can take, right? That's how we feel about our problems. But Paul says here, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, he says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That means that the pain you're going through right now, that those Things in your life that that seem to want to overtake you. That sickness, that sadness, that suffering, you know, that lack, that loss. Whatever that pain is, that pressure, those problems. All of these troubles are getting us ready. Listen to me. They're getting us ready for an eternal glory. Listen, ain't nobody excited about that. You know, we're all excited about heaven one of these days. We ain't eager to get there today, right? Anybody ready to go today? I mean, yeah, pastor, I'm ready. Okay, well, listen, we'll work that out for you this afternoon. (laughs) Listen, nobody's excited about that. You know, and so when we hear things like this, you know, it's like, okay, well, one day. No, listen, we're getting prepared for that. And you need to understand God is preparing us for that right here on this planet. And if we don't have that preparation, guess what? We don't have. We don't have hope. Man, if this is it, we don't have hope. You heard me say before, you're not taking your car, you're not taking your house, you're not taking your clothes, you're not taking your china, you're not taking your job or your money, you're not taking all those shoes you got stuffed in the closet. None of that stuff's going to heaven with you. But you know what is? Your character. And you know what else is? You. Everything else gets left behind. The only thing that's going to glory with you is your character and you. So God's going to naturally, he's going to naturally be a whole lot more interested in your character development than he is your comfort. Because comfort is going to be for trillions and trillions of years. This, right now, the life you're living, the struggles that you're having, this is the get ready stage. This is the learning stage. This is the warm-up stage. This is the, the preparatory school for heaven, if you will. And God says, all these troubles, all these struggles, all that pain, all this stuff is getting us ready for an eternal glory. He says this, that ought to outweigh all of the other things in your life. 
Studies have shown that although many of the people who were in concentration camps in World War II, you know, many of those people died. But some of them didn't. Some of them actually survived. And those who survived did so, listen to me, by finding meaning and purpose in their pain. That's not unusual. I mean, you can handle an enormous amount of pain when you realize that there's a good purpose for it. I mean, the labor of having a baby testifies to that truth. But when you don't see any purpose in the pain that you're going through, then it's easy to give up. It's easy to give up, especially when you're shaking your fist at God and saying, why didn't you stop this? Why are you allowing all this suffering? Well, the, the same God that's allowing all this suffering is also the same God that's allowing all this pleasure, that's allowing all this joy in your life. He's the same guy that's allowing you the freedom to make all the choices you want to make. Listen, when the pain in your life is unending, when it never stops, when it just keeps on going, you need to see God's purpose. You need to ask yourself, what's God doing with this right now? And then tell yourself, first, he's trying to get my attention. Okay, God, you got it. Second, he's trying to bring something good out of this bad. And the third thing he's done is he's trying to prepare my character for heaven. He's given me the opportunity to grow in Christ-likeness. Things that are seen don't last forever, but things that are not seen are eternal. Next is number five. God gives us the hope of heaven. This, this life that we're living right now, man, it's not all there is. Whether you know it or not, whether you understand it or not, whether you even believe it or not. It's like the song says, we're living for so much more than just a funeral. The amount of time you're going to spend on this earth is like a mist sprayed in the air, and some of you are feeling that right now. Listen, you're not only going to, to, to understand as your, your body starts getting older, but you're blessed. I mean, you're only going to get maybe 80, 90, maybe 100 years, and then it's over. And that's nothing. It's going to be, it's going to be over before you realize it. It's nothing compared to eternity in heaven. The Bible says that we have the hope of heaven. And if there was no hope of heaven, I would have nothing but hopelessness. Because listen, there's just too much bad in this world. There's too much bitterness and anger in this world. But the fact is, 1 Thess Thessalonians 4.13 says this. He's talking about believers who died. Paul says, we don't want you to be ignorant about believers who have died. We don't want you to grieve like the people who have no hope. Did you notice that phrase? People who have no hope. Paul says, we don't want you to grieve like that. Which you understand, there, there's something so much more for you. There's two kinds of grief. You can grieve with no hope or you can grieve, you know, with hope. And I can assure you, you're going to want to, to, to grieve, you know, with hope. I told you last week as a pastor, I don't know how many funerals I've done. I really don't, more than I, could, I, I care to, to, to count. Very first funeral I ever did as a brand new pastor, I was in my early 20s. Very first funeral I ever did was a, a mother and father who killed their child. Talk about getting your teeth cut on the very first funeral. It's like, I got nothing to say here. I mean, are these people going to die for this? They're going to jail? I don't, know, I don't know what to say right now. I mean, I was overwhelmed with that. And every funeral I've gone to since, I've been overwhelmed by them. You know, either in a good way or a negative way. Because death is an absolute reality for us. I don't know how many times I've stood at the bedside of somebody talking, you know, uh, about what's going to happen as they're taking their last breath. Again, more than I, I care to count or recall. I've been at the funerals of many of those people and I've looked into the faces of family and friends who had absolutely no hope when their loved one died. I've seen the terror on their faces. I've seen the hopelessness in their eyes. And I got nothing for them. I mean, the Word of God makes it very clear. With Christ you get this. Without Christ you get this. I mean, there's no middle ground. There's no such thing as purgatory. There's no such thing as, well, we'll get here and let God figure it out. No, God already figured it out. 
He said, make this choice or make this choice. As I set before you today, life and death, you choose. Blessings or curses, you choose. It's up to you. I want you to choose this, but it really is up to you. And so imagine people who chose this. I choose death. I choose curse. I've looked those people in the eye. I've seen the hopelessness. I've seen the fear and the terror. Folks, the test of your faith, the test of your belief system, the test of your worldview is not how you handle the parties of this life. The test of your worldview is how you handle the failures and how you handle all the funerals and how you handle the deaths of life. That, to me, is the real acid test. I mean, as people who have asked Jesus Christ to save us from our sin, the Bible says that we have hope. If you've asked Jesus Christ to redeem you, to save you from your sin, in other words, you admit, I've, I've made some mistakes, I've done some things wrong. It doesn't have to be, you know, the worst thing in the world, but you've done something that you know separated you from God. They call that sin, and you finally acknowledge that to God, say, I've sinned against you, God, I ask you to forgive me for that, and you accept his forgiveness, and, and, and you begin a relationship with him, then you are people of hope. You have hope. So we grieve, but we grieve with an amazing hope that takes us beyond our pain. I've often wondered when a Christian dies, why do we grieve? I mean, Christians are going to heaven. They're going to that place they were made for, you know, where they're going to spend eternity. They're going where you're going to go one day if you know the Lord. So why do we grieve? Truth is, we miss them. That's why we grieve. We're not grieving them. We're grieving our loss. About four years ago, I went to a family reunion on my mother's side, and it was the last time I attended was maybe 14 years before that. And so it had been a while, and it was somewhat, at least for me, it was somewhat bittersweet. My mother died about 12 years ago, so it brought back a lot of memories. My mother was tortured by depression. You know, she had chronic pain. You know, when she died, I think I grieved her, her painful and tormented life much more than I grieved her sudden death because I know today, I mean, when I was grieving, I know it had to be more for that than anything else because I know today, you know, she, she has no fear. She has no pain. She has no depression. She's no longer tormented by her past. I mean, every one of her questions have been answered. She has unspeakable joy and that's all based on God's word. She has a perfect understanding. Everything she's always wanted to know. Why did I have to live like this? You know, why didn't I get well? All those questions were answered. answered. So I'm not grieving the fact that she's in heaven. I grieve the fact that she's not here. I'd love to have both my parents back. I miss them, you know, terribly sometimes. So when as a Christian we grieve... We grieve in a very different way than the rest of the world. We grieve with hope. Non-believers grieve without hope. Now, you can try to convince yourself, oh, my grandma, she was always this sweet lady, and, and she was always kind to other people, so I'm sure she's going to heaven. Listen, I don't care who you are or who they were. God says, choose life or choose death. It's up to you. And then he says, I want you to choose life. But it's still your choice, and I'm not going to take that from you. And so those people, as much as they want to tell themselves and comfort themselves, I know my family's in a better place. There's something inside of you telling you, I don't think so. I don't remember Grandma ever going to church. I don't remember Grandma ever telling me about who Jesus Christ was. I don't ever remember Grandma on her knees praying to God in heaven for me, my family, or anybody else. I remember a lot of things coming out of Grandma's mouth that wouldn't be acceptable in heaven. And you start, you know, kind of putting that together with the Word of God, and you realize, I don't have the hope that I know this person over here has. Non-believers grieve without any hope, and I've seen firsthand how devastating that can be for someone. But listen to the hope that we have as Christians. 
from Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. The Bible says, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, no more pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. Man, I am so looking forward to that day. I mean, it's one of the things that allows me to see people starving from poverty, to see people beat up and abused and misused. It allows me to see all the pain in this world and all of its depressing nature and still have compassion, still have emotion, still have, you know, some sort of love for people. You understand that if I didn't know that one day God is going to settle the score, that he's going to, to even the odds, that he's going to balance all these accounts, and if I didn't know and believe that one day there really is going to be a heaven, that God's going to wipe away every tear, there's going to be no more death, there's going to be no more mourning, there's going to be no more suffering, no more crying, no more pain, and that this current order of things will absolutely pass away. Folks, if I didn't know that and believe that, I think out of self-preservation, alone that my love for others would grow stone cold just like Jesus warned Jesus said in Matthew 24 12 because of the increase of wickedness the love of most will grow cold folks the only way to keep your heart warm or warm up your cold tired heart is to invite Jesus into your pain invite him into your grief he promises to you know if you will that he promises he'll comfort you and bless you he'll make you happy blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted the hope of heaven is one of the six ways you know that God comforts a broken heart There's one more thing, and this is a big one, and many of you are already deeply invested in this one. Number six, God uses our pain to help others. This is really important for you to understand. I mean, there is a purpose in your pain. This is what I call redemptive pain. This is the highest and the best use of the pain that you go through. God doesn't want you to waste a hurt. You know, but you know we do it all the time because we're not willing to use it to help other people. God uses our pain to help others, and this is the highest and the best use of the pain that you've already gone through. I mean, who can better help the mother of a special needs child than another mother of a special needs child? I mean, who can better help someone who's lost a son or a daughter in a war than somebody who's lost a son or a daughter in a war? Who can better help someone who lost a limb than someone who's lost a limb? Who can better help somebody who's gone through the pain of addiction, of a failed marriage, of a molestation, or any of the other evils in this world than somebody who's already went through that? Listen, God doesn't want you to waste your hurt. He wants to redeem your hurt. And He wants to redirect your focus. Now again, let's go to God's Word and and find that passage of Scripture that you can use as a foundation to build your faith on. In 2 Corinthians 1.4, Paul says this, God comforts us in all our troubles so that, watch this, so that we can comfort others with the same comfort we received from God. Listen, I believe that our greatest ministry will come out of our deepest hurt. You hear what I'm telling you? I know for me personally, my greatest ministry will and has many times come out of my deepest hurts. And the same can be true of you because you can relate. You've been there. You've done that. You felt that. You believe that. You've experienced that. You you know, many of you hid from that. And you ultimately, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you've overcome that. You can say that I had a mother who was abusive, I had a dad who was distant and left the family, I had a failure in this area or this area. Your greatest ministry may very well come out of the deepest hurts that God brings you through. Listen, we think that some of the world around us, or we think that somehow the world is impressed by how we handle our prosperity. 
But you know, the truth is, I really believe the world is actually so much more impressed by how we handle adversity. We think that it's our success that gives us credibility to be a witness of God, but God says, no, it's not. It's not. Our suffering gives us credibility. You would not believe the doors that have swung open wide in my life as a result of where I've come from and the many things that God has brought me through, as well as the things that God's brought our church through. We think that fame earns respect, but it's actually faithfulness in tough times. Here's the bottom line, and I'll say it again. We're living in a broken world. I mean, absolutely nothing works perfectly. That means that every day you're either going to need comfort or you're going to need to comfort others. Right now, you're in one of two categories. Right now, you either need help because you're in really bad pain. you got suffering going on in your life. You walked in here this morning. Your stomach is churning. You need somebody to care for you. You need somebody to, to just love you and, and have compassion on you. Or you need to help others. And maybe, just maybe, God wants you to be both at the same time. He wants you to both be in need and ready to help someone in need all at the same time. You know what that's called? Being a wounded healer. Wouldn't that make a great t-shirt? Just wounded healer. That's who we are. If you wait until you're completely healed to help somebody else, guess what? You're going to be waiting a long time. Because you're never going to be fully healed of everything in your life until you get to heaven. So if you're going through a tough time right now, the Bible says comfort one another and to give each other strength. That's what the body of Christ is for. That's what the family of God is supposed to do. We're supposed to help each other. We want to help each other. God doesn't want you to carry your burdens alone. God sees us even when, you know, we feel like he's forgotten us. He sees what breaks our heart. He sees what's keeping you up at night while everybody else is sleeping. He sees those places in our hearts that are so hurt that we absolutely feel hopeless and helpless. And yet we know in his word, we know in his word through the promise of Isaiah 61 that he comforts all who mourn. He provides for those who grieve and he promises to bestow on each of us a crown of beauty instead of ashes. God says to us that he would give us joy instead of mourning. So today we come together as a family and we come with open hearts, I pray, and with open hands asking God for healing. Healing from physical pain. Healing from sickness, from disease. As I said last week, whether it be cancer or addictions, anger or bitterness. Whether it be your struggle in your marriage, struggle in relationships or your finances with your children or all of the above, it doesn't matter. Some of you right now and, and maybe you're not here, but you know others that are. Some of you right now are living in a medical mystery land. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, no matter how many times you go to the doctor, no matter how many tests they take, no matter how many different types of pills they prescribe, they still have no clue how to help you. Anybody know somebody like that? Anybody here like that today? Well, you know what God says? God says, I am the great physician. And that we can pray together this morning for those who need physical healing. When's the last time you wanted to invite God into your pain where you were willing to maybe just be a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit embarrassed, walk down in front of this church or somewhere else and say, God, I want your people to pray for my healing because I am an absolute train wreck right now. Maybe it's physical, maybe it's emotional, maybe it's spiritual, whatever it is, you've not invited God into that pain. You've not invited his church into that pain. And so guess what? You still own it. But you don't have to. You don't have to. God says you can invite him into that pain. You can pray for that healing. You understand we can ask God for the wisdom we need to go through the grief that we're living in right now? the kind of wisdom that goes beyond our own understanding, the kind of wisdom that gives us the strength to endure. I believe that God wants to bless, He wants to make happy, and at the same time comfort the brokenhearted. 
He wants to restore broken relationships and reconcile our families, our friendships, our loved ones, our spouses, our kids, the people you work with. But you got to invite him into that pain. You got to invite him into that problem. If you think, well, listen, I don't want anybody to know that my wife and I aren't getting along. I don't want anybody to know I'm mad at my kids. We just paint this smile on our face, get out of the car and walk in and act like everything's okay when it's not. God says, blessed, oh, how happy are those who mourn. If you can't mourn, if you can't be honest with God and his people, then you get to own this. And I'm telling you, it's not something you want to own. It's something you want to surrender over to the Lord. God wants to give us the courage we need to get through all those hard places in our lives, those places where we feel like giving up. He wants us to give us, he wants to give us a hope, you know, that depends on him. And that no matter what happens in our lives, we're still blessed by him. Let me tell you something. In all of our brokenness, if we will depend on God, if we'll be poor in spirit, if we'll invite him in to our pain, we will become living trophies of His grace. Amen? And others are going to see that we've not given up on Him and that our hope is fruitful because our hope is truly in God. One last thing before I close. We need to pray today. We need to pray and ask God to redeem our pain and to to bring purpose out of it. And allow him to use what's happened in our lives for his glory, for his honor, and that he would draw people to us, people that we could help, people that we'd be willing, you know, to to share our faith with. People that would be willing to look at us and see Jesus, because in our darkest times, we've not given up on God. Listen, I don't know about you, but I I am very thankful that this life is brief and that our struggles are only momentary and I thank God for the hope of eternity. But we need to commit to living our lives in light of eternity and we need to do it with passion and drive. We need to do it with the hope of Jesus Christ. Blessed, oh how happy are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Do you dare invite God this morning into your pain. Stand with me as we close. I'm going to ask our counselors to come. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, some of you already know. God's already prompted your heart. He's already given you a deep sense of conviction that you need to be one of the first ones that stand before Him today and just cry out, God, I want to invite you into my pain, whatever it's going to take. This morning as our counselors come, Do you understand that we can pray together for those who need physical healing? Man, if you walk out of here with physical problems that you've not even tried to surrender to God, problems that you've never invited Him into, then don't be mad about that when you wake up tomorrow still feeling it. He's inviting you right now to pray together with his body for the physical healing that you need. Some of you may need to come this morning and ask God for the wisdom that you need to go through all the grief that you're living in right now. And not just wisdom, but the kind of wisdom that goes beyond our understanding, the kind of wisdom that will give you the strength to endure. Is anyone here this morning willing to come and, and pray to God to restore and reconcile broken relationships. Listen, we can pray that God give us the courage we need to get through all those hard places in our lives. Those places that we feel like giving up. One last thing. Can you come this morning and ask God to redeem your pain? To help you understand how to bring purpose out of it. How to help other people with the same help that God's given to you. This morning, as God gives you an opportunity during this time of invitation, would you take it? He's given you the choice. Choose life or choose death. 
during this time, would you come?